Coming up uh, in the St. Paul Forum today, we're going to learn about AVP, the Alternative to Violence Project. Welcome again at the St. Paul Forum. So uh, with me today is uh, Joanne Perry and Tom Maher. And uh, these folks volunteer with the Alternatives to Violence Project. Um, welcome. Thank you. We're Thanks. glad to be here. Can one of you kind of give me a thumbnail sketch of what the, what's a, what the project is? Let's, get, let's start with kind of a short description. Sure, you want the history? Um, Alternatives to Violence Project actually started back in 1975 in a prison in New York State called Attica, Attica. and they had a really big riot happen. And uh, through the course of the riot, a number of inmates had been killed and a number of guards had been killed. And yeah. once it all kind of, once the smoke kind of cleared and the dust settled, it was actually the inmates who said, uh, we don't want to live like this anymore. We don't want to live in a violent atmosphere. We have to live here, but this doesn't have to be violence. So they wanted an alternative to violence. So they started working on how can they create an alternative to violence. Now, being in prison, of course, the resources were limited, and they actually got connected with the Quakers. And the Quakers, this is just kind of this is, you know, how did what that they happen? did. You know, uh, Joanne, can you speak to how that happened? Yes, I can. Uh, the Quakers have a long history of working in the prisons, way oh. back to the 1600s. It's, wow. The prisons have always been a focal point for them. And so they were already there. And so when the inmates, they were called the think tank, that group of mm. people at Greenhaven. Wow. Okay. After they'd been moved out of Attica, they went to Greenhaven. And the think tank uh, decided to ask the Friends, or the Quakers, Religious Society Friends, for help. And they wow. fleshed out this workshop, 22-hour workshop, uh, that focuses on conflict resolution, communication skills, um, problem solving, nonviolence, active nonviolence, mm -hmm. and it's kind of unique in the fact that we do three a lo three levels of workshop, a basic and advanced, mm -hmm. a training for facilitators. So we're always replacing ourselves. So most of our um, facilitators at least when we're doing workshops in prison, are from the inside too. Okay. So we, we have a very balanced team. We learn leadership, team building skills, things like that, and learning how to present in public. So the core of the Alternatives to Violence Project is a series of workshops. Yes, it is. And they're very uh, intensive workshops, is what I understand. Mm -hmm. They take place over three days. Correct. There are 22 hours, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Wow. And they are experiential workshops, so we are really focusing on learning by doing. There is no top-down lecturing whatsoever. We, we basically practice what we're going to try to do in the future. So it's, it's very participatory. You've got, you've, you've got a set of people who are trained mm -hmm. in facilitating the workshop, mm -hmm. and then um, as time goes on and, and uh, people, other people get trained, there's some, there's, um, then new people are able to facilitate workshops, mm -hmm. and so it's kind of a building right. process. It does build on itself. The training for facilitators, the final workshop of three, is really about creating a bigger facilitation base. Yeah. And, and I mean, this is the, the model we use not only in the prisons, but also in the community and uh -huh. in the schools and even in the work with veterans. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the same format nationally and internationally. So um, give me a sense of the scope of this. You, um, so y you guys are working with a local chapter, mm -hmm. or uh, Minnesota chapter, mm -hmm. of what is a national and even international effort. How is it organized? How extensive is it? How, how, how many people kind of come through this project? A typical workshop would have 20 to 25 participants. Yeah. And we would also have a, a team of anywhere from three to six people who would facilitate the workshop. Okay. Uh, in Minnesota, we are involved at Stillwater. We are involved at Moose Lake. We are involved at Faribault, Minimum and Medium. Hmm. Also, uh, Sherburne County. And hmm. we are also in the federal systems in Minnesota. We're a, a seek a prison for women. 
Okay. Uh, that's a scope in Minnesota alone, and we also do community workshops and occasionally high school right. workshops. What percentage of your work is in corrections with inmates? As, and 99 as percent of our work in Minnesota right now is there. Okay. That is not true in the other states. Oh. Um, California has a huge population of inmates, yeah. and they also have the biggest AVP program in the world because we are kind of set up, as you were asking earlier, by small locals. Yeah. And usually each state has its own local, mm -hmm. but sometimes when California is so huge, they've got more than one local facilitating uh, workshops there. Sure. And after the, um, well, the Minis in the U.S., uh, we are under uh, an umbrella called AVP USA, yeah. uh, which is actually our website, www.avpusa.org. <laughs> uh, we're going to put that on the TV screen. Cool. Okay. And internationally, there is also an international AVP, and each one of the countries has their own mm. um, umbrella organization. And then again, they break it down by the individual locals. Okay. And in Minnesota, or locally, the sponsoring local organization is Friends for a Nonviolent World. Correct. It has a grassroots component, a very local component, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there's some uh, coordination or what what kind of support do you get from uh, is there a national organization that um, feeds into the work that you do or well the national organization sets up guidelines yeah uh, for presenting and what what are the minimum pieces that need to go into a workshop but the national office is actually here at the Friends for Nonviolent World office. So yeah. we are part of the national and the local effort right now. But no, there is not a governing board, so to speak, except. They, but they, oh, all right, so they will provide you with uh, some resources, the manuals that right, you use, right. the curriculum, yep. if you will. Yeah, and an interesting thing about it is, so she said we've got the, the basic and the advanced and the training for facilitators. Yeah. And the basic, you know, they're basically all the same, but you may do some different exercises from weekend to weekend. Mm -hmm. But what's really interesting is when you get to the advanced, in the first night you do kind of do some team building and kind of create the circle and kind of create the group. But at that point, at the end of that night, we, we ask them, what do you want to learn? What do you want to work on? What's the mm -hmm. challenge that you have? So we actually take what they want, and the rest of that weekend is totally unique because it's what about that group of people, what they feel would benefit mm -hmm. them the most, and then it's up to the facilitators, both inside and outside, to create the weekend that suits the needs for the specific men and women in that weekend. So every advanced weekend can be completely different. Yeah, you know, we were talking earlier, and I said it kind of sounds like a retreat, and and you challenged me on that, uh, <laughs> saying that it's it's a, it's uh, a lot, it's 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 really hard work, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, tell me about that. I mean, is there a need to kind of get past people's initial defenses or something to get down to the level where you can really engage? I think so, and I think it, you know, it varies from person to person. Uh, what interesting thing is I've been on a number of weekends, and on at least two separate weekends, at the end of the weekend we usually ask the people, they have an opportunity to say what they got out of the weekend. Mm -hmm. On two different weekends I heard two people stand up and say basically the exact same thing. They basically said, you know, the reason I came here was because I talked to my probation officer, correction officer, whatever, they said I needed more hours, I need another certificate in my folder. Mm -hmm. So I need another certificate, so I'll sign up for this AVP thing, I'll go do it, I'll get my certificate. So I yeah. signed up, yeah. but then they say, but you know, I got here not really expecting to do anything, and now I'm here at the end, and they both said, there's something different here. Yeah. There's something about this, yeah. and they both said, I like this. I think there's something here for me. So they kind of went into it just to get their hours and their certificate, and they came out of it thinking, there's a different world for me. There's a different opportunity for me. There's a different path I can take, path I can choose. There's really something here that can really benefit me. It was really powerful to see two different people on two different weekends have that same response of just wanting the certificate and nothing else, and really coming out of it with something of value that they can use. Mm -hmm. There are different kinds of groups that you might join or go to for different life uh, situations um, and, and a lot of those you you can keep going to on a regular basis mm -hmm. so if you go through the workshop as a participant and you want to stay connected to this or keep 
how do, how do, you, how do you do well, that? Well, that's kind of what the third is the training to facilitate. Okay. And uh, they can do the training to facilitate, and if they feel like, I'm good, I've done all the courses I don't want anymore, uh, then that's fine. But a lot of them really kind of go, they, they get to training to facilitate, and now they get the opportunity. They can go through basic again as a uh, facilitator. They can go mm -hmm. through the advanced as a facilitator. And it's kind of twofold because I'll hear them say, you know, I really want this because it's really good for me and I want more and I want more depth in what I'm getting. But yeah. they're also starting to say, I want to give back too. I want to help the next guy. Right. They gave this to me. Yeah. I want to give back. So they can continue to come back to the weekends, not as a participant per se, obviously facilitators participate, but yeah. it's in a different way. And even your first time facilitating, it's a learning experience. Each of the courses is a learning experience. And even if you facilitated two, three, or four times, you're still learning. I've done a handful of weekends. I'm still learning. Joanne has done several handfuls of weekends. <laughs> I'm guessing she'll say she's still learning. So, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's always a con. And you see that once they've, there's a thirst, there's a hunger for something different and to learn. And I think the leadership thing too is, is possibly something, you know, they may have been in positions their entire life where they've been told, 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 yeah. told, 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 told. Right. Now they can actually lead mm -hmm. and they can step into something different in an authoritative power that's not a, not a bad authority, it's a good authority. Yeah. So it's really something that I think they're really drawn to and I, they really like coming back for what they can get and give from the, uh, from the facilitator position. Yeah, that would be really empowering. Mm -hmm. How, you were gonna say. Yeah, very recently, um, O.J. Simpson was on national TV and on front of his parole board, and when he was asked what was the single most important thing he did, he said it was the Alternatives to Violence program. Nice. He yeah. said it should be mandatory for everyone, but what I really learned was I learned that I didn't have to go to violence, I could have a conversation, mm. which is a lot of what we teach, is that you've got a choice. There are options available you may never have considered, but they are there. Yeah, and the old saying, you can't teach a new dog or old dog new tricks. I don't know how old OJ is, but he's up there and he's, uh, by his own statements, he's learned that there is a difference, that you can teach that old dog new tricks, you can learn and you can change. And I mean, that's a great testimony right there. Mm -hmm. um, I want to add in there though, that also the veterans groups are finding AVP very effective. <coughs> ways of getting over the PTSD, to reintegrate nice. back into society, yeah. um, ways to tell your story and a chance to give back. People learn to heal. It's a self-healing program, mm -hmm. I think, at its, its most basic level. Is mm -hmm. We learn that we have choices. We learn that we can do something differently. We can learn that we can stand up and speak for what's important to us. Yeah. And that, that's where it can be really challenging, especially in the basics, is it, when it's the healing part, because um, a lot of the guys feel like, oh my God, here comes this emotion that I, you know, us tough guys, we don't feel emotion. We're not supposed to have emotion. And they feel they're going to cry. Well, you know, can't cry in a room full of other guys. And, you know, mm -hmm. so there is that challenge. So it, it can be really draining and emotionally uh, healing. And, and so they, and mm -hmm. all of them have the option at any point during the weekend, if there's an exercise they don't want to do, they have the option not to participate. And I've seen some exercises that were really challenging where more than half of the guys in the group chose not to do it, and, and that's their right, you know. But then, you know, when they do get into it and do do it, the healing happens and there's, there's a lot of great stuff that goes on. But it's not easy. It's tough work for, for, for them and for us. Well, it sounds like a real kind of paradigm shift, too, and it makes me realize that in, in this society, I'll say, you know, in the education that we get and the, the entertainment that we get and the news and the education and even the politics that we're, we can, that we're exposed to, it's all about conflict. Um, it, there, 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 we're never taught how to do um, conflict resolution as an option. And, and there's parts of our culture that have this macho yep, kind yep. of confrontation. And, yeah. and if you're in an environment like the military or, or in corrections, obviously, it's even harder. Yep. Yes, it is. And I love what you said about paradigm shift. I was on a weekend with one guy and we were talking and he was saying that one of his challenges, he doesn't want the conflict, he doesn't want the violence, he doesn't want the aggression, yeah. but as someone's talking to him and they're escalating and he's escalating and they're both right. kind of escalating their voices, he's like, how do I get out of that? What do right. I do? Because I just, I, you know, that's not what I want. Right. And we we're just kind of riffing on some ideas. I said, y you want to want to try something? He was like, anything you can tell me. I said, okay, the louder they get, 
Just keep your eye contact with them and just speak at your level and All just right. maintain your level. Because the louder they get, they're going to get louder and they're going to realize they can't hear you, but they're going to realize that you're talking and they're going to want to know what you're saying and they're probably going to stop and drop. Mm -hmm. And they're probably going to listen. So stay focused on what you want and just keep talking at your level, speaking what you want and saying, mm -hmm. I want to talk to you, I want to have a conversation, but I mm -hmm. don't want to be screaming. And if we want to continue, let's keep it like this. And it was like... He, 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 it was like he had never even considered that as a possibility, but he loved it. He was like, I can't, I almost can't wait to get out there and get into some kind of, so I can try that because they want to try these skills. They learn these skills and they really want to try it. So it was real, lots of paradigm shifts. There's a lot of paradigm shifting, mm -hmm. I think. That's what you just described. That's a very specific tool or technique and you're giving people tools that they haven't had before to, um, to take into a situation where right. they might have met it with uh, patterns of conflict before, right? Yeah. The Alternatives to Violence Project believes that we already have the tools inside of us. It's just a matter of accessing them. Okay. That we really have always intrinsically mm. known that if we sit down instead of getting ourselves bigger and bigger, the conflict's not likely to escalate. Yeah. That if we are willing to speak truth to you and look you in the eye and, and listen to what you have to say, mm -hmm. we are really uh, much less likely to come to blows. Um, it is a paradigm shift in a real way, but it is um, a skill set that I think we actually attempt to teach in schools, but until it becomes true for us, which is the thing about AVP, it, it's not really true. Mm. And AVP makes it more real to people, that these, these options are there. Is it more real because in the workshop experience, you're, are, are you doing um, uh, role playing or are you taking actual instances of conflict and working through them to experience that? I would, I would say there's, there's three different things. Um, sometimes we'll do role play, so we'll kind of make it up. Yeah. Sometimes we'll actually ask them to take actual experiences of their life and kind of look at those experiences. Yeah. And the third thing, which is always kind of interesting, is when the actual conflict happens for real right in the middle of a workshop. Uh, so, which I've yeah. seen that a couple times. And so everybody kind of gets to sit back and go, okay, how is it? We've, we've been talking about this. We've been learning this. We've been practicing this. And here's two guys that are really just kind of, and what's, and, and I've seen that a number of times and we've watched it play out and it's, uh, for, for all of my experience, it's always played out well. They've always been able to kind of go and not only play out well, both of them at the end were able to look at each other and thank each other and even hug each other and, you know, really resolve it without any violence. So uh, the real time, real conflict right there, use those skills. I mean, yeah. that's the best teacher. You can't learn anything better than real life, real time right there on the spot. And that well, happens and occasionally. To, to be able to see it in action and see uh, either as a participant or in that group, <clears throat> it, to see it work, I yep. mean, that's that's got to be a lot more convincing than, right, right, right. than to just hear, about, you know. Well, and sometimes in role play, I think, I mean, that is truly effective. Another yeah. truly effective one is we frequently get people who are in on domestic charges and, oh. and really are not yet ready to accept any responsibility in that process. So um, sometimes yeah. role playing a domestic scene, not allowing them to play the role they've always played before, but asking them to play small child in the other room while the drama plays out is really impactful oh, because you yes so yep. you can see it from a whole other point of view a whole yep. different perspective and here's another thing that i think is really interesting which we haven't touched on um, in our society in our culture whether it be in our families or in our schools or in our friendships we tend to accumulate nicknames and we call each other nicknames by different names and things and a lot of times those names aren't always positive positive. and in a lot of times in a prison environment your nickname's not always positive yeah. well when you come to AVP you also choose your own nickname it's a nickname that you have for yourself and it's, it does two things one it helps us remember your name better yeah. but it also um, gives you the opportunity to step into something else because the nickname has to be positive so uh, I'm Tenacious Tommy and this is Joyful Joanne. Mm -hmm. nice. So we think of Joanne and Joanne is joyful and Tommy's tenacious. So they, they get to step into something different to try. And a lot of times when they first pick a name, it could be, some, it could be something like Joyful or that. And it seems kind yeah. of funny. They kind of chuckle about it. You know, yeah. da, da, da. But yeah. as the weekend goes by and whenever they refer to someone, they have to refer to them with that, with that name. And when they refer to themselves, before they speak, they have to re repeat yeah. their adjective name. Yeah. And it really, saying that about, saying those positive things about yourself really begins to sink in 
skin and really becomes to be part of their identity. And I really think that's a, a big part of the transformation because mm -hmm. they're referring to themselves in a positive light, people refer to them in a positive light, and it's just, um, it does become part of their identity. Two things. So how do you know it works over time? You know, and um, are there ways that you follow up with people who have been through the program and then they go on with their lives? This is always a tricky question. You know, the yeah. Part of it is, is that our people are self-selected, so it's very hard to have a control group. Um, somebody yeah, that an official sure. study is going to be able to say, this happens here or that happens there. But I will say that um, staff comes to me on a regular basis at all the prisons I work in and, and says, we really appreciate having you here. We've noticed that once we have an AVP facilitator on the block or the ward or the cell unit, whatever they call it, the violence tends to drop. Okay. And the reason they say that is because not only are people who are facilitating walking the talk, the inmates themselves are forcing them into it. So <laughs> the other people who haven't become AVP people. And, and what happens mm -hmm. is that the joy that you get from actually giving back, yeah. the joy that you get from having a voice, uh, the joy that you get from being part of something bigger than yourselves, yeah. but pretty quick, peop other people want it. And that's, mm -hmm. we yeah. spread by word of mouth. Yeah. Huh. And another good testimony, I think, is because we talk, we do a lot in prison, we do some out of prison. Right. So if I were to apply to work on a weekend out of prison, I may get chosen. But if someone has gone through the weekend in prison and now they're out, mm -hmm. they can't go to prison and, and do it for, for like two years. So oh. if they want to do an outside one, they'll get preference over me hands down. So the guys, men and women who've come out of AVP from the prison, if there's an outside workshop and they want to be in it, they're straight to the top of the list because we okay. want to get, cause, and we do have that. They do want to come back, even once they're out of prison, they do want to come back and share what they've learned and, and give to others. So mm -hmm. that's a nice way of saying, it, they're not just doing it for fun in here, they're actually out and free, and they still want to connect with us, they still want to give, they still want to share, they still want to learn and grow. Why, why is it that they are not able to immediately work with uh, uh, in, inmates after they've Come out of it. You want to address that one? I would be happy to. There, it is the um, state law and the warden's rulings. It yeah. is not anything to do with us. Normally, you have to be off probation for at least a year and many times two years before okay. the, you'll be allowed back in. Yeah. Okay. And actually, there there is someone who who was incarcerated in Minnesota, went through AVP, got out, had been out for two years, and now he does go back in, and and the prison is aware of that. And he, I mean, it's been that good for him where he's able to come back in and work with the men in prison, even though he was he has been incarcerated. So. Mm -hmm. For people who want to know more about this, uh, how, what, what are the resources that they, where, how can they find out more about it or how, and, and how can they get involved or support the efforts? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I would recommend you go to the Friends for Nonviolent Worlds website, fnvw.org. Okay, we'll put that on the TV okay. screen. Uh, you can also call the office. You can mm. send us an email. Yep. Jen Hamrick, she'll be happy to talk to you. She'll take good care of you. Very nice woman. So, mm -hmm. yep. okay. we're happy to get people involved both in the community and in the prison. Okay. You do have to be over 18 to go mm -hmm. into the prison. There is that yeah, requirement. Sure. Um, is it uh, an organization that would benefit from some donations, or how, is there some basic funding that is required? For this is tricky. We are really self-funded. Um, yeah. The umbrella in Minnesota keeps us alive, that Friends for a Nonviolent World, but um, we get by only on donations. We can't take any money from the Department of Corrections or from any other group, or we really have to keep right. it to private people. Or Obvi obviously, uh, the inmate population doesn't have resources, so that they wouldn't be able to pay for right, right. Uh, the, the experience. Yeah. Uh, so donations are welcome. Oh, yes. Always. Yeah. <laughs> and pencils and notebooks. Pencils and notebooks. <laughs> pads of paper. <laughs> yeah, pads of big, big, big pads of paper. <laughs> are, are, are there other ways that people can support the work that you do? Um, well, yes, we, the Friends for Nonviolent World needs volunteers yeah, for okay. other programs or in addition to help supporting AVP. You don't have to be a facilitator to support AVP. We need help with the coordination. We need help with the mm. purchasing of equipment. We need um, help with advertising and fundraising and everything okay. else that any other organization needs. You told me earlier that um, the alternative 
groups to alternatives to violence project is not just a, a, a U.S. program, mm -hmm. it's, it's global. Can you, you want to tell me a little bit? Well, yes, the AVP is on six of the seven continents. We're really not on Antarctica, but I don't think the penguins really need us. <laughs> but uh, in Australia, they focus mostly in the schools. It is part yeah. of the program at both Sydney and Brisbane, and I believe um, in the out a couple of programs in the outback also. Wow. We, in yeah. Nepal, there are a great number of AVP programs. Uh, and they continue, but I did work in Rwanda after the genocide, bringing AVP there, and mm. then again, their training of the people who were being the judges for the Gachacha courts. But Africa AVP is, is slightly different than the U.S. AVP. People uh, like to include song and dance and chanting into the AVP program, okay. and it gets bigger. It's, it's slightly different, and it's still the same program. Yeah, and you know one, one another really cool story. The uh, Joanne and I had worked with this guy, and he'd gone through all three courses, and he worked hard. He was a good guy. He really wanted this, and it was challenging, but he really wanted it. And he was going to get out soon, and he was heading back home, I think, to Nigeria. Mm. And he was like, "Can I do this in Nigeria? I want to do this because he wanted to give back to his people." Mm -hmm. You know, he wanted to go back to Africa, go back to his country and use this with his people. And we said, yeah, we'll have our contact here. I don't know if it was Jen, but someone at AVP in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. We'll contact AVP out in Nigeria. We'll tell them you've done all this and we'll do what we can to get you back in prison in a good way, back in your own country. So mm -hmm. he was really fired up that he could leave here, looking forward to going back to his home country and being able to come into AVP and facilitate and help his own people with some of that stuff too. So that, I mean, I think that was just fantastic. Okay. Have you worked outside the country? In I have not, no. But you have? Yes, I have. You worked, you said, uh, uh, in Rwanda. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, any, any place else? Um, I'm trying to think. I think I did a workshop once in Canada, and oh. I was trying to do one in Sai, no, it was Hanoi. I was trying oh. to get to Hanoi, but uh, there was something went wrong with the plane. But I was scheduled <laughs> to be there, but I couldn't uh, do it. Nice. <laughs> so. It sounds like what you're saying is that um, it can be, an important approach for reconciliation mm -hmm. after. Yes, what? it was kind of amazing that both the Hutu and the Tutsi, the two warring uh, tribes uh, through, the, through the genocide, were able and willing and grateful to be in part of the workshops together at all three levels. And that work has also continued. The, for a while, the UN took over the program in Rwanda, but really? it's gone back to the African Great Lakes Initiative, which has expanded their uh, reach to Burundi, Rwanda, Kenya, Tanzania, and the Congo. So um, is there anything else you want to tell me about AVP? All are welcome. <laughs> welcome. Okay. Well, um, we'll, uh, we'll share the information on the screen again for uh, those who might want to contact or support uh, your efforts. And, um, thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the work you're doing. We appreciate it. That's it for today's St. Paul Forum, and uh, thank you for joining us.